Do you have it? Okay, cool. So thanks for sharing. Uh, Shen just talk about uh, like uh, pre-processing uh, about your then we finally get the data ready so we can think about how to build our model. Um, before we really start, uh, in a kind of common machine learning practice, uh, data co collection, data cleaning, pre-processing, those would usually occupy, say, 80 to 90 percent of your time. When you really get the data ready, like you choose the right machine learning model and uh, doing like proper validation, just take like 10 percentage of time. That's kind of like the time allocation in machine learning practice. So what I'm going to talk is about uh, like some details of machine learning models. Uh, mainly I will cover linear model and uh, kernel model today and the fancy or new-ish deep model will be covered by June tomorrow. So first, I'd like to present a very unified view about uh, machine learning models. We really got like a lot of like names of mo machine learning models. We have like linear models, kernel models, deep models, neural networks, support back machines. Uh, what's behind all those names? When we really say like a machine learning model, what we usually mean is a predictor. So predictor is something like you feed it in like a sort of data and it will split out another kind of data. In the house, pr house pricing problem Sherry just showed, maybe you think about your predictor is a function like you feed the size of a house and it will give you a estimated price for this house. So let's try to make some like symbolic uh, thing here. So x means our input, y means our output. So you basically feed the input x into your predictor or your machine learning model and it will give you a prediction. Okay, so from now I will use th those two concepts like model or predictor like pretty much exchangeably. So the core about machine learning research is about design a objective function and try to optimize it. I'm pretty sure in 99 percentage of machine learning algorithms, if you really look into its objective function, you will always find like two terms. I will call it like loss term and regularization term. Loss term is basically a measure like how well your model or your predictor fits your data. Like if you just fit it the size of house, to which you tend, it will give you an accurate estimation of house price. That's the last loss term cares about. Regularization term is not quite obvious. Uh, what the regularization term cares about is how complicated your model or your predictor is. We have like very simple, like say conceptually simple model like linear model. We have very complicated like models like deep neural networks. And what this regularization term cares is, if possible, let's try to use a simple model rather than use a very complicated model. It may not be very straightforward, like say why we need, I mean, why we even need this? Why not we just find the perfect model that fits everything? The thing is, machine learning is such a powerful tool. You can be ensure that it is guaranteed you can always find a model that fits your data perfectly. It's proved by math. It's nothing about your real problem. As long as you, you're allowed or you want to use the most possible complicated model, you can definitely fit your data. But this kind of like perfect model may not what you really want. Let's take an example like about curve fitting. It's nothing about machine learning, but it's like a very uh, simple thing I think we do in old days. So we have like uh, a number of blue points. Let's try to, f try to find a curve that uh, goes through them. And we can do with like a straight line. So basically it's a, like a, a linear function, right? Um, it does pretty much well. And if you are not quite happy, you may be add a like uh, x squared term, like so you have a quadratic function. So if you are still not happy, you can keep adding higher order of x 
and keep doing it, keep doing it, you have higher and higher order of x, x power 5, x power 6, x power 7, x power 8. And at one step, you will realize, OK, yeah, I do have a perfect curve. This orange guy go across, it goes across every single point. But if you really look at this function, it looks pretty much ugly. And the real dangerous part of really deploy this to the real world is when you have those like blue points, which are corresponding to the training data insurance presentation, when you train your model, get your orange line, and deploy it to like real environment, then the real data, it looks like the, those green points. However, what your model tells you about it are those like red stars on the curve. If you see like the very first point and the very last point, it's pretty far away from the real number. And that's the price like you, you are trying to use a say overly complicated model. Hopefully this, this, this example convinces you, OK, we do need a regularization term. And then we can talk about like model. So I will start with a linear model because it's kind of like a, the easiest one or straightforward one. So linear model, you just saw it uh, somewhere here, right? It's a linear function. You, you don't have this scarily higher order term. For a single variable case, you basically have one scalar x, and you multiply it by a, another number a, and add a bias term, and it will give you a prediction. For like multi-dimensional case, for example, your feature vector, it has like more than one factors, and the model will look like x, uh, y equals w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 plus, again, a bias term. Those like w things, we usually call it weight vector. The reason behind this name is this weight vector reflects how important each dimension of your feature or your input. For example, again, for the house pricing problem, maybe we have like three kinds of features, the size of house, the number of bedrooms, and the distance to the closest train station. And when you really train a model, get those like W in real numbers, you will say, okay, um, size of house, number of bedrooms, they are kind of like positively correlated. And this distance to the classic tree station is kind of like negatively co correlated. That's kind of why we call those WC as a weight vector. So choose to use a linear model is kind of like a very first step, very first step we make, like a very first choice, a uh, designing choice when we decided to use machine learning to do something. Then the next thing follow is we need to pick a loss function. This loss function is kind of like uh, similar to the distance metric Sharon just talk, talked. So it measures the difference between what the model predicts and uh, what the real value is. For example, you can take a absolute value like this. So if your model tells you, OK, I'll, the house price is 3.3, and the real price is 5, then you, you see, OK, the loss or the error is 1.7. Or you can take like a squared error term. So you get, instead of 1.7, you get 2.89. So that's kind of like a one loss term for one particular instance. In the training data, you usually have like uh, quite a number of instances. So when you really calculate the loss, you just sum them up. So that, that's, that's what happens. So you may wonder why, why do we really need this kind of like absolute operator or squared operator? is when you really sum several laws together without a proper operator like absolute value, what really happens is your laws can cancel each out. For example, your model may 
underestimated the price of the first house and overestimated the price of second house without this like uh, absolute value or square value function uh, the laws will cancel each other so you may end up with some measure which does not really reflect the fitting performance okay just a quick uh, recap Okay, we have chosen like linear model as our predictor. We have chosen say squared arrow as our loss function. Now the it's the final step to make a decision like what our regularization term looks like. Uh, it's a bit hard to really explain this kind of thing without say proper math, but let's try let me try to do this. I will present three models with three sets of weighting vectors. I use different color to represent them. So you get this W red guy equals 1.1, 0, 0.0, 0, 0.0. This W blue guy as 1.1, 0, 0.1, 0, 0.0. And this W purple guy equals 1.1, 0.1, 0.1. So maybe we can make this kind of like guess of judgment. Uh, I believe the first model, this 1.1, 0.0, 0.0 guy is the simplest. I call it like a simplest because it has only one non-zero value. It only uses the first part of your feature. So which means like maybe in your, in your feature, it goes like three dimensions, but whatever the second or the third dimension is, you don't use it because you will multiply that feature value by zero. So that's kind of like a very intuitive way to define how complicated your model is. Then we, we define this like loss term. Uh, by the way, conventionally, we, when we really define regularization, we follow like a just common rule, okay? Higher value means more complicated model. So I can define a regularization term as the number of non-zero elements in W. So if I fit the red guy W, I got one. If I fit the uh, purple guy, I got a three. Like, because it got like three non-zero elements. So if we care about regularization, it basically means we care about to, to get a simple model, which means in this case, we want to use part of the features, not all of them. So again, <laughs> I'm really sorry, but uh, if you really want to know why how those like uh, regularization term is found is I, I did it certainly I didn't make it up right so all those things are from the concept called vector norm so this con scary word norm it roughly just means size you, it's just a way you can measure how big your vector is the one I just showed you, the number of non-zero element is called zero norm. We have another kind of like a vector norm. For example, we have one norm, which is the sum of absolute values. For example, if we fit this 1.10.0.0.0 guy, we sum, we take absolute value of each element and we sum them up and, and we get 1.1. .1. And for the third model, we get 1.3. This one norm, uh, if you, are, you have some kind of like statistical background, it has a very uh, close relation with the model called the last regression, but it's kind of out of scope of this talk. And another way is we can use the sum of squared value. So this, we can apply this operator to the fourth model, get 1.21 or the third model like 1.23. Again, this has a very close correlation with ridge regression. So this basically means, okay, now since we choose linear model as our predictor, what really behind the model is a weight vector. And we want to regularize this weight vector and the right mathematical toolbox we are looking at is a vector norm. That's kind of like the whole logic. But for now, you don't really need to dig out this kind of mess. Uh, but in the future, when you really face a problem, you want to know where to look at those like regularization terms. That's the source. 
OK, so now we have regularization term well defined. We have loss term as squared arrow. We have almost a complete form of our objective function. As I mentioned, if you look at every, almost every machine learning model, you got the loss term and this regularization term. And here, your loss term is a squared, square loss between your prediction and your real value. And you have this uh, norm two regularization thing. It's just a sum of squares of your weight vector, right? So the last piece is not really there yet, because the last piece is we need to somehow balance, balance th those two terms. So that's, we can put, that's why we can put another scalar vector on the regularization term. It's fine if you want to put this scalar vector for the, the loss term. It's pretty much the same, same thing. So what is this uh, lambda guy? What is this scaling fa factor means? If you can recall, Sharon, she just talked about like uh, overfitting and uh, underfitting thing, right? If you set this like lambda guy very small, like close to zero, what it really means is you don't care about regularization. You just want to find the best model in terms of fitness. Then you are kind of like have this real risk of overfitting a model. On the other side, if you set this lambda guy very large, then you have like a very small space that you can pick your uh, parameters. So maybe the best parameter is not in that space. Then what you get in the end is a model that does not really fit your data well. So you have the risk of underfitting. So like we are trying to find a balance between overfitting and uh, underfitting. What we really means is we're trying to find a proper scaling factor for your loss term and the regularization term. Right. So OK, just have, we can have a very quick summary about this machine learning 1, 2, 3. I call it machine learning 1, 2, 3 because we just exactly did those three steps. First step, we choose a predictor, or we choose like which kind of model we want to use. In this example, it's a linear model. And step two, we will choose a loss function. It's like a measure, be, different measure between your prediction and the real value and you choose, say, squared error. It's another choice. And the final choice is to choose a regularization term. You can choose like zero norm, one norm, two norm, or any kind of thing you believe makes sense to make a very good judgment about how complicated your model is. The, you put them together, right? Your red guy is the predictor. You feed the data, multiply the uh, weighting vector, and uh, as those bias term, that's kind of your predictor. Those like a squared guy is your loss function. And the, finally, the proper guy is your regularization term. To really solve this like objective, objective uh, we, I mean, normally we don't really do it uh, uh, like manually. Maybe if you took one machine learning course, they would like teach you how to do it. But uh, in the real world, we wouldn't do it. We will seek for some help of like, uh, optimizer software. So we got like a free one, like a SciPy or some like commercial, <laughs> commercial version. Uh, the reason I want to point out this is kind of like this optimization or the process of finding those parameters W uh, and B. This process uh, is kind of like a mass area called optimization. And it's kind of like the boundary of machine learning. Some machine learning researcher they did quite a lot of research about uh, find a, a good optimization. But uh, in general, uh, optimization is kind of like an independent research community. And uh, you do have a lot of good choices. So unless it's absolutely necessary, we usually just pick some suitable uh, software rather than like manually do it. OK? Now I just finish the first linear part. So before I go to kernel, maybe we can, if you have some questions, before I go to kernel part, you can ask, yeah. Yeah, so you, um, you mentioned uh, the number of input features as being used to quantify the complexity of the model. What other methods are kind of used to refine the regularization? 
Uh, yeah, for more complicated model, you do have like uh, different ways to say regularize the model because we just covered the linear model uh, part, uh, uh, and the deep deep model will be covered tomorrow. But I can briefly uh, tell you how can we regularize a neural network, right? How can we regularize a neural network? It's kind of like a, See, a bit crazy. Think about this. Neural network, whatever, it, how, uh, how complicated it is, it's still a function, right? You feed some input, like image, it split something out, for example, what's, the, what's in this image. And the way we regularize deep learning is to add some noise, add some noise to the input and to the intermediate products. That's not like a function per se, but uh, if you think about what this really do is if your deep learning model is robust to those kind of noise, it cannot rely on every single kind of input because otherwise if you add noise to that part, it will produce some nonsense result. So it can only rely on some kind of data for either input side or intermediate product side, then you somehow believe your neural network operates on some certain interesting part of image, not all of them. And the way you enforce this is to add random noise. Uh, what I, uh, since this uh, topic was mentioned, uh, the choice of regularization is kind of like tied with the choice of predictor. For example, if we go back to this curve fitting problem and think about how can we define a regularization term for this kind of like a polynomial function, this kind of function, right? So maybe a very simple way is we can find the highest order of your polynomial function. For example, the regularization term for this guy is nine. The regularization term for this guy is eight, right? So that's yet another way to define regularization, but uh, it only makes sense to polynomial function. It doesn't make sense for linear function because it, the order is always one. So that's why I usually say you decide to use, you make the choice about which model you're going to use first. Then you find the corresponding way to define the regularization term. So would you use dropout as a form of regularization in linear models? Yeah, if you think about dropout, okay, uh, uh, I kind of like steal some materials from drawing side. Okay, think about dropout and this noise, right? If the noise happens cancel out the input, it just happens in that way, right? You have a new row with value like uh, 1.0 and you row a random number is 1.0, it's exactly kill that new row. Right, so the, the, you can still link this drop out thing with this kind of like added noise story. Right, but which one would you have suggested would be more effective uh, for a particular kind of application? Uh, well, there is no quite to say very. Because if you're doing an image, for example, yeah, and you add noise to your image, and yeah, your image is looking for your algorithm is looking for something very sensitive in the noise floor of your image. Yeah. Then you have the great potential to regularly mask yeah. the um, the thing that's very sensitive in your image that you're trying to find, right? Yeah. Whereas uh, dropout, on the other hand, is just a way of saying, well, for this particular instance of the learning loop, ignore this parameter. Right? Yeah. So um, what I'm trying to understand is for a very simple, uh, that's, a, that's a complicated example, yeah, that, but this simple example, mm -hmm. would you have suggested that one method was more appropriate than the other? Oh, actually we do have like a number of the criteria about uh, how to really cho make a choice about regularization term, right? So for example, in this case, I, I do give the like zero norm as a way to uh, Define regularization term like it's like number of non-zero element, but that's usually what we try to avoid. Why? It's very simple because this is a so-called non-smooth function. You feed this W guy in 
to this like uh, recognition function, you can only get exactly three values, one, two, or three. Which means if you think about uh, the take the say gradient of the whole objective, this recognition term it doesn't change because you move your w a tiny little bit, then this guy doesn't change. On the other side, if you use like absolute value or square error, squared uh, arrow, then you don't have this issue, right? You don't really have this kind of problem. So you move W a bit, then uh, RW changes correspondingly. Great. So that's like uh, it's one kind of uh, thing you may consider when you make choice about recognition to make your problem, say, fairly easy to optimize. So they, I think I will, yeah, I will go through the kernel model. So then let's look at this problem. Again, it's about curve fitting, but visually it cannot be fit by a linear model, right? It's kind of like, it look like a fine function for me. And for this 2D case, of course, you can eyeball check your problem and make the choice, OK, maybe I don't want to use linear model. I want to use something else, because it's certainly not a linear correlation. However, for high dimensional space, for example, you have several feature vector. You, there is no easy way you can do this kind of visualization. What really happens is you worked very hard, but your linear model didn't work. Then you, at that time point, you say, oh, maybe I should change a model. So here I'm trying to offer like the second family of models called the kernel model. It's a bit really say, scary <laughs> to teach you about it, like proper math behind the kernel, but maybe we can do it by hand. It's not that hard if you break it down. So what I will do for those like nine blue points, I write down the input and the output, the x and the y, right? So because your feature dimension is only one, so it's just a series of numbers, and the uh, ground truth for your prediction is a series of numbers. You just write it down, keep it here. And what you are going to do is you are trying to compare your first data point against all the, rem all the data points your training set. So what you really do, like, uh, again, it, it involves a choice of like uh, how you really ca calculate the uh, difference. But here, let's try to use this squared arrow term, right? So you compare x1 with x1, you got zero, because it's the same thing. You compare x1 with x2, and you calculate a number. You compare x1 with x9, you get a number. So what are you going to do, just compare arrow y against arrow y. You do the same for x2, you do the same thing until you arrive x9, and you get x9 minus x9 squared, 0, right? So let's put everything into a matrix. It's not a very scary matrix. It's like it has only 81 values. It's a nine rows, nine column matrix. And if you check the diagonal uh, part, is exactly zero because it means you are comparing something with itself. And there is a very strong pattern if you visualize it because I put x in like a, in an increasing order. So you always say, OK, uh, the diagonal part of your matrix and the close value, they are kind of like small. And you go to the top right of bottom left, uh, you see like some large values. So basically, this uh, just like uh, a, this matrix just stores the so-called pairwise distance of all your data, right? And the next thing I do, it may not make sense for now, but let's do it anyway, is you take the negative sign of that matrix, and you put a exponential function on it. Then what's this like? Uh, negative exponential means is you somehow transform a distance measure to a similarity measure. If you look at this like k matrix, the diagonal is 1, means a data is more similar to itself. And if you go close to the top 
right corner or bottom uh, left corner, you will see a lot of zeros because, as I said, your x is in an increasing order. It becomes less and less similar to a number, right? And by the way, that's the name of kernel method comes from. This matrix is called a kernel matrix, but it's essentially just a similar pairwise similarity matrix, right? Okay. So if you visualize it, you will see like uh, all ones for the diagonal part and uh, the value vanish when you push to the boundary. That's what you get. And here's the surprising thing. Then you basically treat your key matrix as a new kind of input, and you fit a linear model. So the difference is now in old days, the original format of your data is one dimensional. Now your data is nine-dimensional. So instead of its original value, you use its similarity against every single training data point as your feature. Now you fit a linear model, and because actually this way of constructing kernel matrix is very nice, this linear model is fairly easy to fit. And I, I will just write down the value here. Now you have a model in nine-dimensional space. Uh, but still remember, your data is in one-dimensional space, right? What would you do to really deliver a prediction? Now, assume like you have a new data point coming in, x star equals 1.0, right? How, how can you find out the corresponding prediction like y star? We, we do pretty much the same thing, right? We compare this x star with every single point in your training set use the exactly same distance measure. Here is like a squared arrow thing. And you get a vector in nine dimensional space, right? By put a negative for, for your distance and put the exponential function outside. So this k star thing, if you take every element out and exact what it is, it's very easy. See, your data, your nine training data, 0 0.0, 0 0.7, 1.57, blah, blah, thing, and your new incoming data is 1.0. And this k star vector, each element is kind of like the similarity between x star with every single uh, element in x, your training set, right? That's why you see the second value 0.95 is the largest, because the second value in your training data is 0.79. It's the value which is closest to your new incoming data, right? So now you basically, again, transform your new data point into a nine-dimensional vector. And what you do is just like what you do in the linear model, you do dot product between your weighting vector and your k star, like the new representation. Uh, in case you really want to do it, it's basically like you do element-wise multiplication and some things together. And you will get the prediction. What is this like? If you just fit all those possible points, and this kernel method deliver a model like those orange line, you may, uh, you may be aware, okay, this orange line, it goes across every single point. It's not a coincidence. It's guaranteed to do so. And the reason it did, it did this is I didn't put a regularization term. If you go back here, go back here, and when I see you saw a linear, regression, a linear model problem or linear regression problem, uh, I didn't mention any regularization term. If you do add some regularization term, you may have another kind of like form, which may not go across every single point. But it's not a very big issue for now. So again, to sum this thing up, the key idea of kernel, in my eyes, is about feature transformation. So you transform your feature from its very original form to a series of similarity with respect to your training data, right? So, uh, but to be honest, it's mathematically, it's not the right way to understand this kind of kernel model. But uh, I, I believe it's kind of like, it might be easier to 
get the first kind of like impression of it in this way. And in the last stage, when we see like uh, when we see uh, we fit a linear model, uh, we can choose to uh, put a regularization term on the nine-dimensional weighting vector as well. And actually, in common practice, we do uh, put a regularization term. But now, this what this regularization term does is quite different with what the regularization term in normal linear model. Because what this regularization term means, for example, if you again use zero norm, it means it will pick just a few data points. Because now your W matrix, uh, sorry, your W vector is nine dimensional. Each is corresponding to one of your training data point. And if some value in your W are zeros, which means that a specific data point in your training set does not contribute to prediction because you multiply it by zero, right? So why I mention this? Because you may hear a thing called like a support machine. It was very popular between. It was very popular before deep learning. The name of support vectors. It actually comes here. It means when you really do this kind of like comparison, you don't do it with respect to all points. You just pick some important representative ones and do the similarity computation. Okay. Uh, so that's it. So any question for the kernel part? Nowadays, you, you spoke briefly about, about uh, deep learning. You mentioned um, deep learning can approximate almost any manifold into any kind of space. Yeah. Uh, how does that compete against kernel methods? As in, do we still need to bother with kernel methods, or is it that nowadays you just throw a DNN at it and then you have your fitted? Uh, it really depends on your application. For example, uh, for like. Uh, uh, where deep learning was very successful is called uh, like image re recognition, right? Like or face or any kind of like um, recognition problem. For that kind of problem, you may not uh, you may not want to use kernel method because think about this: those like very advanced deep models they were trained from a data set with like more than one million images. If you want to use a kernel method, which means those like controllable nine by nine matrix, it would become one million by one million. I mean, I mean, in the end, of course, you may just select a few of them, but during the process, you still need to get this one million by one million guy first before you can really select some support vectors, and it's not like a modern computer can do. However, if you just have a bunch of data, like say 1,000, 10,000, this size of data, and your data is not quite, say, uh, images. It may be another kind of format. A funny thing about the kernel method is if you think about the core concept is you can compare two data points, right? But it doesn't really mean those two data points are vectors. For example, you can do kernel method for tree structure, which means your input is a tree, as long as you can find a way to me measure two different trees by, for example, adding distance. For that kind of application, I think kernel method still got its very unique advantage. Uh, 